I want to give a shout out to our other monthly webinar series, which is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. It is entirely in Spanish, including the title, which translates to The Science of the Sky for Beginners. Each webinar introduces basic science and astronomy concepts and provides opportunities for casual discussions between presenters and participants. It's totally free and aimed at the general public, age 12 and up. The broadcast all about stellar physics is scheduled for this month on the 15th, and we will continue to broadcast these Spanish webinars on the third Saturday of each month all throughout 2023. Please feel free to spread the word to your Spanish speaking friends and colleagues. And now back to the webinar at hand. Our 2023 how to series is sponsored in full by Boyce Astro. We'd like to take a moment to thank and acknowledge them for their generous support. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please do check out their webpage to learn more about their work. All right, now today we are going to be talking all about AAVSO Net. AAVSO Net is a remote telescope network which any AAVSO member can use. It is a big topic to cover, so we've brought in four different speakers who have experience using the network. To start us off, we'll be hearing from Dr. Arnie Hendon, the mastermind behind the whole network. Then, after Dr. Hendon's introductory talk, we'll hear from three different observers who each have years of experience using AAVSO Net. Finally, we'll wrap up with a 30 minute Q&A session so that you can get answers to any questions that you have about AAVSO Net. Should be a very informative session, so let's dive right in. First, I will introduce our speaker who hardly needs an introduction. Dr. Arnie Hendon is a professional astronomer and equipment guru with a PhD in astronomy from the University of Indiana in Bloomington. During his career, he worked on such prestigious projects as the Large Binocular Telescope and also built a wide array of specialized scientific instruments, including a near-infrared imager and spectrograph for the 1.8 meter Perkins Telescope in Arizona. He also served as the executive director of the AAVSO from 2005 to 2015 and, just this past November, was elected to the board. During his time as executive director, he played a critical role in founding AAVSONet and growing it from a single telescope to a powerful worldwide network. Today, he remains heavily involved in the project through his role as the leader of the AAVSONet section, and he even runs one of the Bright Star Monitor Observatories, BSM New Hampshire. I can honestly say that there is no one out there who is more qualified to talk about AAVSONet, and so it is with excitement that I introduce Dr. Arnie Hendon for our very first talk of the day. Dr. Hendon, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you very much, Lauren. Let me share my screen. All right. So, um, if anyone needs to get in touch with me, uh, I, my email address is at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I'll also give you some other links and emails later on. Uh, the AVSO Robotic Telescope Network, as Lauren says, has been in existence for sort of 15 years. Uh, started out with one telescope, the Sonoida Research Observatory down in Sonoida, Arizona and uh, has, has expanded incrementally since then. There's uh, literally 100 people who really need to be acknowledged for this uh, development of, of this facility, because not only have people contributed uh, funds and equipment, uh, but there's also been numerous volunteers who have built enclosures and uh, uh, operated the telescopes and built the pipeline and all the other aspects of such a, a complex network. So what is AVSO Net? It's a remotely uh, accessed set of telescopes that are used mostly to collect photometric images, though we are branching into spectroscopy. 
it's for AVSO members only. So you need to be an AVSO member in order to use it. Uh, so far, we've uh, acquired something on the order of three or four million uh, images. They are actually on the cloud and can be accessed. Um, but um, primarily it's uh, images collected today, gets shipped to uh, the appropriate people. And um, uh, the rest of the images are kept for uh, quality control and things like that. The, one of the big advantages of it is that it's full sky. We have Northern and Southern hemisphere sites. Uh, there's two in Australia, one in New Zealand, for example, as well as the Northern Hemisphere. And they come in more or less two flavors, a wide field telescope, which is about 180 millimeters or eight, uh, seven inches in diameter. And then what we call narrow field or faint uh, star monitors, which are generally 20 inch, 24 inch telescopes. One of the big differences between this system and say something like eye telescope is that there is an image pipeline that produces calibrated images, namely those that are bias subtracted, dark subtracted and flat fielded, and they are automatically sent to various users, people who've requested the data. So again, you have to be an AVSO member, which means you have to um, get a membership, which is currently $95 per year for adults. But after you do that, there is no hourly fee to access the telescopes. So you don't get charged by the hour. You get uh, free access to the telescopes uh, through uh, submitting a simple proposal form that I'll show you in just a minute, which states what target you want to look at and why you want to observe it. So why would you want to use AVSONet? Well, you could be living in the downtown Minneapolis where you have a bright sky and you just can't see the stars. You may not um, have space for your own telescope. Uh, many people that uh, use the facility live in apartments or have homeowners associations that don't permit observatories. You may be in the Northern Hemisphere and the object you want to see is in the Magellanic Clouds. You may not have the funds to purchase the equipment that's necessary to do a full robotic uh, setup. Or you may not have the skills to put such a system together. And uh, the system, the AVSO net telescopes are also used for things like the choice courses uh, to help you learn how to do photometry uh, and in the future, how to do spectroscopy. So like I said, there are two basic system types. We call them bright star monitors, which give you photometry basically down to about 14th magnitude in at least the four Johnson Cousins filters. In many systems, such as the one that's in my backyard, there are specialty filters such as neutral density filters um, or uh, diffusers that will allow you to uh, obtain even higher uh, precision in your measurements. These systems typically are sort of a one and a half square degrees of sky coverage. And if you went out and tried to buy one of these systems, it would cost you some, something in the order of $40,000 to put it together. So it's a really nice choice system to, uh, to have access to. The faint star monitors, on the other hand, are actually run in partnerships. We do not own this equipment at all. They are usually at the facilities of a university or a small partnership. Uh, typically 24 inch apertures, uh, both again in the north and the south. And these are for generally reserved for fainter stars because the field of view is much smaller. Here's a map showing the current facilities. You can see they're concentrated primarily in the northern hemisphere. Uh, someday we may move into Europe or into Africa in order to give a little bit better longitudinal coverage. Here's a typical one of the, the bright star monitors. This is the one that's in Hawaii. You can see they're using these Takahashi's E180 uh, astrographs on a Paramount ME, so it's really a nice system. And here is one of the 24 inch systems. This is uh, what's called OC61 for optical craftsmen, 61 centimeter. 
located uh, Mount John, New Zealand. You can see the, the mountaintop over here. It's a little uh, thousand foot hill. Uh, and the telescope is, uh, like I said, an optical craftsman located in a nice uh, ash dome type uh, facility. And here's another one of these uh, 24 inch telescopes. This one is in the hill country of Texas and is run by a partnership of uh, amateur astronomers, most of whom are also AVSO members. Here are some light curves. This is taken straight off of our website. Uh, these are things that Lauren put together, which is really nice of her to do this, uh, showing the kinds of stars that could be covered by AVSO net. And the AVSO net observations are shown in color. And here are some more. These are from Frank Shore, and I think he will have certainly an update on these stars. You can also do things with with uh, that re require extreme precision, such as an exoplanet transit. We have done a few of these. They require uh, time series observations using a single telescope for multiple hours. We don't normally do that, but we can do it on, on occasion, especially if you can give us a solid reason for doing so. And here's another example of uh, the fact that many of these, especially larger facilities, uh, larger sites like the um, uh, MPO 61 in Texas, you can actually do uh, high um, precision um, spatially resolved imaging as well. This is a Z tau, which is a Myra type variable. And it's, it has a very close companion. And you can see that uh, the visual uh, observers tended to um, uh, lose the actual Myra variable itself and started reporting the observations of the companion. Whereas if you can actually resolve things, you can actually follow the, the uh, Meyer variable uh, to its much fainter minimum. So on the web, there are two main uh, sites. You can just go straight to the, the top web page and work your way down. And that's where you would go in order to join the, the AVSO. And then uh, the lower link is to the actual AVSO net uh, pages themselves. And on that page is a proposal form. And this is what the proposal form looks like. It's very simple. There's a space in the middle for actually writing your proposal, what you want to do with the star. Uh, and then you just give the target name and uh, its right ascension and declination. And then this goes to a telescope allocation committee that will uh, review your proposal and assign a telescope for uh, acquiring the data. Also, though, on this proposal page, you see that there are also other tabs here. One, for example, is operations, which if you click on that, you can see what telescopes are currently actively taking data. And then you can even uh, drill down further and see on the last night that it observed what objects it was observing. So the AVSO net images themselves, like I said, are calibrated before you receive them, but you are required to do all the analysis steps. So measuring the star brightness, reporting things to the AVSO, you can use any application that you want, or the images can actually be uploaded to VFOT directly and you can uh, do your measurements there. So like I said, it's a very simple process to um, use AVSO net. Um, and the, the main thing to, to note here is that the acquisition of the data is fully automatic. You don't have to do anything, but at the same time, that means you have no hands-on access. You don't get to say, okay, well, I'm finished with that object. I want to move to another one of my objects. The scheduler actually tries to optimize the use of the telescope and will insert your necessary observations in between other uh, researchers who've asked for time on the telescope. There's also another neat thing that people don't necessarily know about, and that's what's called the Epic Photometry Database. For every image that's taken with AVSO net, we actually post-process it and extract every star from that image and put it into a text file. And then once a year, we run a script that goes and does differential photometry on the whole works. 
stores it in a membership accessible database that you can query. Uh, so this is a feature that's designed so that if there's a, a variable star elsewhere in your field of view, the uh, data for that star is um, kept in, in, in this external database and can be queried by researchers who want that kind of information. So like Lauren says, there are going to be three people who will be talking after me about specific uses of AVSONet. And if your questions are not answered in the webinar, there is a uh, email address that you can use to uh, query and somebody will answer you and give you more information. So that's all I have at this point, and then I'll return it to Lauren. Great, thank you very much for sharing. that introduction. All right, so next up we have got the Observer Showcase. To get us started with that, we will be hearing from Enrique Boniker. Enrique is an amateur astronomer and astrophotographer who has been observing the sky since 2018 when he purchased his first small binoculars. By the end of the year, he had made the very wise decision to become a member of the AAVSO and started learning about the surprising stars that we call variables. Today, he is a regular contributor of observations, both spectroscopic and photometric. He makes almost all of his photometric observations using AAVSONet, and for the past several years, he has been leveraging its capabilities to study a very intriguing short period pulsator, which is what he's planning to share with us today. Everyone, please welcome Enrique Boniker. Okay, let me let me do the same thing, share my screen here. Okay. Oh, sorry. Let me share it. Here it is. Good. All right, here we are. Well, thank you everybody for being here. It, it is such an honor to be participating in this webinar uh, with well-known astronomers and observers, actually, with a uh, Arnie Hendon, Arnie Hendon, well known for all of you, Bill Sullivan and Frank Shore. Not to mention our host, Lauren Harrington, who is a very enthusiastic and skillful spectroscopist, by the way. Let me start by telling you that uh, I live in Mexico City. Living in a city like mine poses maybe too many challenges for an amateur astronomer such as myself. Besides the awful light pollution now aggravated by LED street lamps and superluminous billboards, we have to add increasing levels of smog and of course, a very generous rainy season that lasts longer and longer as the years pass by. So all this means that I have not too many clear nights during the year, and this complicates any kind of observations, not to mention to conduct any kind of follow-up. Back in the year of 2020, I heard that the AABSO was organizing several free webinars covering a lot of interesting topics. It especially caught my attention, one that was held on June 27 by David Cole and Bill Stein. This webinar explained in detail how the Bright Star Monitor worked. Now known as AABSO Net, it features several observatories in continental US, Hawaii, Australia, New Zealand, just as Arnie Hender uh, told us a few minutes ago. This network of telescopes is available for members of the AABSO that are in the need to gather either photometric or spectroscopic data of one or several stars. This means in practical terms that you can still contribute meaningfully with high quality data no matter how bad the conditions are in your place. But here's a catch. You have to pick up a star or a group of stars that are worth observing so that you can be awarded with valuable telescope time. I have to recognize that the possibility of being able to gather data with research grade observatories was too exciting for me. In this way, I had the chance to contribute with continuous observations for the AABSO and thus provide some quality data to some professional astronomers in the future. Not only that, thanks to this network, 
I could forget, <laughs> at least for a while, the fact that I live in a multi-polluted and often cloudy city like mine. Okay, now, what did I do next? Of course, try to pick up a good star to observe. Uh, I went first to the variable star index, ESX we call it, and looked for delta C phi type of stars. I chose this type of stars because they are used as standard candles. This means that they are very good to measure distances, not only in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, but also to other nearby galaxies for, of the local group. Not to mention the fact that delta C phi stars are pulsating stars, which makes them super interesting. When I made a general research of del for delta C phi stars in the, in the VSX database, this is what I got, a humongous list with lots of stars. Kind of overwhelming for me. So to be honest, decided to make some research and found out that beta delta, excuse me, that beat delta C feeds, known as delta C feed B, were not so popular among observers. The list consisted of only about 25 stars. Most of them had very few observations. The rock star, no pun intended here, of this group is TU Cassiope. It even has its own article in the AAVSO webpage. TU Cass has to date more than 25,000 observations. Just below this popular star, if you notice, the next in this short list was ASK, ASCAS. On that time, it had only one observation registered in the VSX. By the way, I just found out, this is very weak, that the poor and sad star V1345 Centauri has also one observation today. So if anyone cares to adopt it, the star will be very grateful. I know beforehand that it's going to be a very, very good star for you guys. Well, back to business then. As ASCAS being practically an unobserved Delta C feed B star resulted to have under its sleeve an extra bonus and a surprise. Let's start with the extra bonus. Delta C feed B stars at, at least feature a double mode period. This means that they have at least two pulsations. And here is where the surprise shows up. ASCAS was observed by Dr. Arnie Hendon in the late 70s. Not only that, Dr. Hendon himself was the first one to find out the double mode nature of this star. Then it was decided I needed to adopt ASCAS. We'll show you now in general terms what I did to get this started. I went to the observing sections, which you can find below the AAVSO main page. And immediately after that, went to the AAVSO net site read the instructions on how to write the proposals to ask for a telescope time. In this proposals, besides explaining why you want to observe a particular star, you have to suggest the pace of the observations you might need, the filters you want to use, and establish a total amount of time these observations should take, among other important parameters. In my case, a few days afterwards, I received a positive answer informing me that the observations were going to be achieved basically in two observatories, one located in New Hampshire, the one that Dr. Hendon runs actually, and the other in New Mexico. We then agreed that the data gathered should be downloaded to my VFOD account. I will stop right here just for a moment. This is because I think this will be a good advice for all of you. I decided to use VFOD software because it is online and can be accessed anywhere, and because it has a very advanced and convenient and uh, has very advanced that will help you control every step of the photometry process. On the other hand, for the AAVSO, it's also very convenient that you use VFOD, since for them, it's easier to download the observation files from different observatories to this platform directly. At the end of the day, you will receive an email every time you've, you have fresh data for you to process and analyze. Okay, everybody, here's the beef. Since the 22nd of July, 2020, we, and by we, I mean the AAVSO net team and myself have been observing ASCAS. 
These are the light curves that include the last observations made until February this year. Please excuse me for presenting you a graph with titles in Spanish. I used VSTAR to generate it, and I simply could not find an option to change it to English language. Maybe I should reinstall the software again. Well, enough chit chat, Enrique. Up to date, we've got this. We have made a total of 2,537 observations, 742 with Johnson's B filter, 745 with Johnson's V filter, 385 with Cousins R filter, and 665 with Cousins I filter. In this graph, you can see the light curves of all these filters. To figure out the fundamental tone and the first overtone of ASCAS VSTAR was used. You can get this light curve analysis software also from the AVSO uh, website. I've used the software to execute a date compensated discrete Fourier transfer, or DCDFT for short, and the cleanest algorithm to figure out the fundamental tone and the first overtone of ASCAS. The preliminary results are the following. The fundamental tone of ASCAS is about 3.025 days with an error of about uh, 1.7 times 10 to the minus five, which is a very small one indeed. And uh, the first over overtone is about 2.155 days with an error of about 9.6 times 10 to the minus three. But look, Science really loves to surprise us from time to time. I recently gave a quick look at the near infrared data taken with the Cousins eye filter and stumbled into this. In this light curve, it seems that the last set of observations are brighter than previous ones. Don't know really if this is for true or something during the photometric analysis was done differently. I personally don't think this is the case. Maybe. This is a hint that ASCAS has a third unaccounted long-term period, but this is just a hunch of mine. And this hunch, I want to believe, makes it worth following up the star a little bit further. Well, thank you very much for your time. For me, it was a pleasure and an honor to talk to you about the amazing AAVSO net, this and this little tiny star of mine, ASCAS. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Enrique. That was a top-notch presentation. Much appreciated. Thank you. OK, um, so next up, we are going to be hearing from Phil Sullivan. Phil is a longtime AAVSO member. He actually joined uh, back in 1974 as a visual observer. He started experimenting with CCD photometry in 1995 after he built his own camera using the instructions in Richard Berry's famous CCD cookbook. He was able to further his learning by taking some of the AAVSO's choice courses, as well as attending the CCD school, which Dr. Hendon ran at Tufts University in 2012. In 2015, he graduated from student to instructor and started teaching the AAVSO CCD photometry courses. He taught that for six years, and then uh, he also began using AAVSONet in 2018. For the past several years, he's been working on a project using AAVSONet to monitor a standard field. And with this, he's been able to increase the precision of the photometry that he gets out of his AAVSONet images. It's this project, which he's hoping to share with us today. So everyone, please welcome Phil Sullivan. Okay, am I all connected up here? Yep, looks good, we see VFOT. Okay, uh, this uh, project I'm going to talk about started off as an experiment for using uh, BSM images in the CCD2 course. And after the course was over, I kept getting these images and I kept measuring them. And it's gone on for about three years now. The uh, CCD2 course uh, uh, dealt largely with uh, uh, calculating and uh, applying transforms. It already, it also had uh, a 
observing a class observing uh, project in which uh, members of the class would make observations of various uh, variable stars. They had to make the measurements, submit them to the AVSO. And by the end of the course, they had to be submitting transformed measurements. So uh, for transformed, you need to have what's called a uh, standard cluster. Now I'm gonna not talk very much about the transforms here, but the standard cluster requires that uh, is required for making the, the calculations. It's, a it's a, generally an open cluster in which lots of stars have been measured very carefully in multiple filters. This means that these become available as uh, comp stars in the field where of the uh, cluster. So right now here on the screen, you should be seeing uh, an image of a uh, star field. This is a uh, star field for NGC 7790. The image was uh, made by uh, BSM New Hampshire. And the important thing I want to show you, first of all, this is this is NGC 7790. Here's another cluster here. This is NGC 7788, I believe. And also, this is an inverted image because you can see by the uh, legend down here. The thing I want to point out to the you right now is that this distance in the image is a little bit more than 80 arc minutes. In other words, this is a huge field of view. And this is one of the great properties of the bright star monitors. And I think they're pretty much all the same. It's a really large field of view. Okay. Um, What I did uh, uh, for the observing project, uh, I picked out several stars to be used for uh, various polar observations. And then here we go. These are the stars uh, that I have been observing or had been observing and th that the students could use. CG is a Cepheid, Delta Cepheid. EU is a Myra. TZ is a class L, which I have learned, heard of before, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. ERCAS is a SR, a semi-regular variable. Uh, these here are more Cepheids. QX is a eclipsing binary, at least it was eclipsing binary at some point in the past. However, about in the, in the 1980s, I think it was, Arne, correct me if this is, I'm wrong here. This is when it started, the, the uh, this eclipses got shallower and shallower and eventually just disappeared. So I wanna I start with a little explanation of what's going on here. Uh, let's get away. Can I move my? I think I can move it. Okay. I, I need to be able to move my screen or make my uh, images a little bit. Hmm. I'm having trouble. I need to be able to clear, use, use the VFO. So Phil, are you trying to scoot your browser window over to the right? Yes, I'm trying to okay. shoot the whole thing over to the right, actually. OK, so if you move your mouse up to the very top of your browser, um, are you able to grab onto it on the top right to the right of the plus button, not on the plus button? Can you click and hold and then drag to the right? Will that move it? 
no. Maybe I can okay. close one of these. Um. Ah, there, there we go. go. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So, let's see. One more time. Okay, so this is the official. This is the official um, AVSO sequence for X caps. And if you look over here, these are the these are the comps, and there are 12, 12 comps in the sequence. Two of them are, are uh, saturated, so you can't use those. But still, having 10, 10 comps, 10 good quality comps, is really, really nice. Now, I'm going to show you the light curve. This is QX class light curve. And then move it down here. I started observing star for the course in uh, November of 2020, and it's actually gone now to February, end of, uh, beginning of February. Um, the students like this one, so a lot of them were observing it. The, the, uh, brown, the brown crosses are my measurements. The uh, rest are all student measurements. And since this actually kind of messes up the light curve a little bit, I asked all of them to put a little note in the uh, data uh, comments that is for the CCD photometry course in 2021. So this could be cleaned up easily later on. And now the the theory about why this uh, why this star stopped eclipsing is that there's probably a th hidden third star which is causing the orbit of the eclipsing star to process. Uh, Billy, then, you've got about two minutes, Tristina. Okay. So, anyways, this is going to uh, so this is one of the stars. I'm going to show you another one. ER CAS. This one worked out really well for the students uh, since it uh, seems to be uh, a popular star that like her is pretty, pretty good. And uh, I'll just kind of quickly zoom in here. Here you can, here you can see some of the students, and here are my measurements, and the students are doing pretty well in here. Uh, the point about this is that if you are observing, if you can use a bright star monitor telescope, you have a wide field of view. If you're observing in a the field of a standard cluster, you have lots of good comps. And if, you could, if you're observing with VFO, then the image is showing your VFO, uh, you know, cacao. So it's really a lot of fun. You can observe lots of stars with the same, using the same images. Uh, and um, I'm planning on continuing this for a long time. Okay, that's about all I have to say. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Phil. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really great tip about observing standard fields there. And it's great how you're able to use these in the course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so if you could go ahead and just uh, close down your screen share real quick.
you can do that up near the top of your screen. If you move your mouse up there, you'll see a, a toolbar up here with a red button that says stop share. Ah, oh, yes. Should I close this now? Stop share? Yeah, go ahead and stop uh, share. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. All right. Now, last but certainly not least, we will be hearing from Frank Shore. A computer engineer by trade, he received his first telescope at age 13 when his mother saw an opportunity to have someone come outside and observe with her, which is just marvelous. As a member of the Miami Valley Astronomical Society, he helped to found the John Bryan Observatory in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And in 2006, he actually built his own remotely controlled observatory out at Deer Lake Astronomy Village in Georgia. An AAVSO member since 2007, he served as a co-leader of the Long Period Variable section and worked on LPVs with humps and LPVs with period changes. You might have actually uh, read some of his articles from that time. He has some good ones on the AAVSO website. He started using AAVSO Net 11 years ago, and since then he's contributed over 35,000 observations to our database. He has quite a list of fascinating stars, which he uses AAVSO Net to monitor. And today he's here with us to introduce us to a few of the most intriguing. Everyone, please welcome Frank Shore. Hey, how are you doing? Good afternoon, evening, or morning. And let me share my screen. Hey, um, I'm going to move this so I can actually see up here to. That's interesting. It's not going to let me uh, show me. It's not going to let me uh, put on it and make a slideshow out of this. That's interesting. I'm going to stop the share. Okay. Lauren. Okay, and go I'm going to reshare this time with my desktop. So that should take care of the problem. Okay. Good thinking. Yeah. Put it there. Now, does it? Uh, we can see your desktop. We can see the slides. It also has the toolbar at the top. So they're not full screened yet. Yeah, we're moving that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And is that better? All Perfect. Right. So um, this is, I, I kind of focused this on my use of the AAVSO net. Um, and I'm going to talk about three of my favorite stars, um, how I use it and three example projects. As Lauren said, I, 2006, I had an observatory built in Deer Lake Astronomy Village in Georgia. And I just had to give a plug <laughs> for Deer Lake. That's my, that's my observatory about two months ago. We were refurbishing it. Um, I joined in, Lauren said I joined in 2007 uh, because my best friend was a member of the AVSO. And uh, at the time, I mean, I have a long history of observing, but at the time I wanted to do something a little bit more, quote, serious, unquote. And looking around at a lot of stars, I found that LPVs were my favorite virtual uh, uh, variable stars. And after a while, I started getting interested in LPVs that stalled or had humps on their ascending light curve. And at the time, I just I still, I can't imagine the forces involved that would cause a Mara to stall. And here's an example. So we have a nice light curve and uh, it stalls for a number of days. And this is uh, RU her, and then continues on its way. And the next time it might start doing the same thing, or it may not do it, it may do nothing. Uh, these humps come and go on these light curves. So it's some transient sort of washing around or something. Um, at that point, I did a survey of 450 Myers, about 450 Myers, and I looked at their light curves for the previous 20 years, looking for humps and bumps in their light curves. and. Uh, the results are on uh, AAVO's web, website at uh, lpv-humps, if you want to see what I've done in the past. First project I worked on was S. Orion. Uh, it was my favorite star. It's the one I first found a hump on, and uh, just one of my favorites. Um, when I started, I started to use the AAVSO scopes in 2012, about 2012. And in 2014 to 16, I wanted to do a project 
to look closely at the light curve of S Orion. And I thought maybe there would be some turbulence when the humps started or the event started or stopped. And I just, I needed um, a higher cadence. I wanted daily images at least to have a very close look at the light curve. But I, I you know, it allowed me, this would allow me to do, figure out what parts of the light curves I wanted to focus on with my own telescope observatory doing high cadence, you know, 30 second all night kind of uh, imaging. And um, I couldn't uh, do the daily observation with just my telescope. Whoops, just my telescope because I'm in the Southeast of the United States and we have a lot of clouds and uh, humidity and so on and so forth. So I just couldn't do a daily cadence. Uh, so I started using um, the AADSO telescopes for that. Uh, this this is just a picture of BSM New Hampshire, and in the back's the old one, and this was the one that used to be down at HQ. Arnie suggested that I use the AVSO net BSM scopes to get a high cadence daily. Uh, whoops, can't touch that. Can't touch that. Uh, cadence to set up a daily high. He set me up imaging on four BSM BSM scopes, New Mexico. HQ in Boston at the time, South and Sydney and Barrie and Perth. As you can see, I could get coverage of both hemispheres, which uh, was ideal. It, it allowed me to avoid image data gaps because of weather and the South, particularly like in Southeast, Southeast the United States or Southwest uh, United States, equipment problems because stuff breaks and uh, free time issues, particularly on my part. Uh, I only have the time, I only have weekends. I could really free myself up. And the following is a partial result of that campaign. Um, I just wanted to show this is this is pretty much the campaign time, and I wanted to show how good the light curve turned out. Now this was before the the latest upgrades, and down in here, I believe, well these blue, uh, the blue images, uh, the blue results down here, I believe, when we found problems with the blue filters, Astrodon blue filters, which gave us different results, and I have no idea what happened up here. Anyway, overall, it allowed me to try to estimate, try to look at these curves when we transition into a, a stall and out of a stall. It allowed me to concentrate on those. Um, and unfortunately, the project showed no turbulence, which I guess is a, a valid uh, data point. Um, and then I started to observe 18 other, I liked AAVS, AAVSO net so much, I started to observe about 20 other underobserved stars that have humps, period changes, dull maximas, uh, S spectrum and C spectrum or carbon stars, uh, the S spectrum is oxygen stars, just because they were, uh, each one of them had unusual characteristics. And uh, Lauren and Arnie showed this too, but Lauren did this slide or did this uh, chart showing s some of my light curves. And again, I wanted to show how good the results were overall. The light curves uh, are overall using AADSO net. Uh, right in here, right in here, where you're T CEP, we're starting to show a dull maxima. Maybe WCAS is heading that way. Um, and each of these has a uh, humps that. Oh, and then there's a little notch here on TCAS, which I'm trying to spend a little more time with. This is unusual. I'm waiting to see if that happens again. Can't explain that might be part of a dual maxima result. But uh, at least this is an example of some of the, how, how some of the light curves turned out. Um, now, this is one that our, our AQR project, it's a symbiotic star. Uh, there's a nice picture of it there. I wish I could get a bigger one. Uh, it's a Mara and a white dwarf together, which is kind of unusual. I only know about 10 or 12 of those that I know of that, that are like that. It has a 44-year orbital period, and uh, it eclipses. There's an eclipse that occurs about six to seven years long, about every 44 years. And it's, it's, it's felt that a dust cloud may be obscuring part of the light curve. And uh, there's an excellent write-up on AAVSO website, dot s underscore rq that really gets into detail past anything i could talk about uh, this light curve is just my results there's a gentleman on the on the seminar uh, franz joseph who's done a remarkable job getting the, the light curve of uh, 
R A Q R. I'm only I'm only showing my results just to show. Well, I'm I'm showing results. Cancel that. This this shows the uh, the dip about seven, uh, 44 years ago right here, and it just started again about four or five years ago. And uh, so this light curves for the last 77 years. There's a dust cloud, which actually has a name. It might be causing a dimming. Um, it's per currently part of an AAVSO campaign, and uh, we get they, they want a daily cadence of BVR and I. And for me, the AAVSO net is the only way that I could get close to that type of coverage. It has a complex spectrum, and there's three different spectrums, uh, the spectra that we're seeing. M7E for the star, the nebula has its own, and the blue companion of type 0 or O or B. This is the chart I meant to talk about. Uh, this is of the current, probably the last, right in here, the last four or five years since this event started, last four years. And Ron Joseph, if you look in the AAVSO uh, database, he has, this isn't the complete life curve. He has done a remarkable job daily, getting daily observations. But again, I wanted to show kind of the results I could get from AAVSO net, which helped to contribute, uh, helped to contribute to the overall light curve. Uh, the notice is uh, 665. It was Dr. Leanne Wilson, uh, a friend up in Iowa State University who really specializes in LPVs and a uh, young lady from Center for Astrophysics. Uh, they wanted nightly observations. And uh, for me, it's for me it's perfect for observing from multiple BSM telescopes, just like I did for SRI. Otherwise, I could get a much better coverage than I could just from my observatory. And this position, so that it's good for both in southern hemispheres. The last one. Uh, uh, the last star I want to talk about is TUMI. Um, this is one of my favorites right now. It's one of the few LPVs that show a dramatic period change. There's only a handful, maybe 10 or 12, that have period changes that are fairly dramatic. This one's the most dramatic. Amplitude changes in the light curve, and it's also changed from a MIRA to a SR, semi-regular LPV. Uh, here's an example. This shows the total light curve probably over the last 100 years. And you'll notice that right around in here, the, the brightness and the curve starts getting smaller and smaller. And um, the brightness is, is dimming. Started about 1977. At the same time, this chart's uh, period chart, which shows uh, the period for each, each year. You can see around at the same time, 1977, 1980, it started decreasing, this period started decreasing and notched a little bit to increase more. And now it's probably even decreased a tad more. So the two things were going on at the same time, the amplitude of the light curve and the period changing. Um, today, this is, this is a current, this is probably the last uh, six months or something. Um, the light curve on, on the V band is down to about a magnitude and a half. And as you can see, it's very unorganized. It may, and some of the theory here is it may have undergone a, a, a shell helium flash in the recent past. Recent being a relative term here. <clears throat> There's helium around the dense core of the star, which in the core is carbon and oxygen, which at some point reaches a cr critical mass and ignites. Um, characteristics of the star change for this type of event is period change and amplitude change and a luminosity change. Uh, second period may occur, and I think that's what's showing up here. There's a second sort of period that's starting to form uh, just from the chaos that's going on. These changes could last for hundreds or thousands of years. And here's a little more detail. As soon as the helium burn burning begins, the shell rapidly expands and the hydrogen burning above it is turns off because it's it's usually hydrogen, what's left of the hydrogen is burning. For about a century, the star derives its energy from the helium flash. And then when it's most of it's concerned, consumed, and, and that producing oxygen and uh, carbon, the flash ends, and, it sh ends and the shell shrinks and the hydrogen burning resumes. And this definitely changes the internal dynamics of the star. Um, it's been said in, a, in the 
literature that a star may undergo several hydrogen shell flashes near the end of its time as a red as a red planet or as a red giant. Only a handful of Myra showed this particular type of behavior, TUMI, RAQL, uh, R Hydra, Z Tau, and uh, W Draw. TUMI has had the greatest period change. So this is what particularly has my interest of them all. Right, I'm, I'm going to say that watching, what, what we're watching here is a rare event that happens in our, happening in our lifetime. These flashes theoretically only happen thousands, every thousands, number of thousands of years and and they could last for a hundred years or maybe longer but we're starting to see perhaps the beginning or the end of one of these flash cycles on this star and one reason i'm observing now closely is i want to know what happens next it could be another hundred years go by and it's still all jumbled up and, and chaotic or it could start recycling the, the inside sloshing around of the star after those big impulses from the flashes could start resolving themselves. I wrote uh, two articles about TUMI, if you're interested in more information. They're LPVs of the month for July 2016 and May 2018. Uh, both of those papers reference a lot of, I mean, both of those articles reference a lot of papers that have a lot more detail. Plus, there's a very, on Wikipedia, there's a very nice little discussion about helium flash that you might, that you might find of interest. Um, a little bit more detail, you can read it if you want, um, kind of a repeat of what I've said. Uh, and all of this came from an article in Sky and Telescope in uh, 1996. So as you can find that article, you can, it's online, you can, you can follow up. Anyway, that's, uh, this is a nice image of S. Orion, my favorite star. And that's pretty much the end of my talk. I just wanted to do a quick drive-by of uh, projects that I find of interest right now. Thank you very much, Frank. That was fascinating. Well, it was it was quick. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, but you really you got into a surprising amount of detail for how quick it was. Well, so thank you. That's sort of a little tiny overview. And um, again, Franz Joseph, uh, is, uh, I also want to point out that he's on this web uh, Zoom. He's done a remarkable job of uh, like hers on our AQR. I really appreciate his work. Fantastic. And thank you. All right. Yes, thank you. And so now we have some time for questions. So um, if anyone has any questions about AAVSO Net, if you have maybe a project that in mind that you're considering and you want to get some input on whether it would be a good fit for AAVSO Net, that would be a good thing to ask about. Or uh, since we do have LPV expert on hand here, if you got a question about that, feel free to put that in too. Um, you can do that in the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen, just like our first questioner has done. So we do have one question here. Um, someone wants to know, does a proposal have to have some astrophysical merit or very few observations that have been done before on your target? You know, are both of those a requirement or none of those a requirement? What's, what's required for putting in a proposal? I'll go ahead and answer that. Uh, and uh, it's good to see Shovik on the online. Uh, anyway, um, basically, the proposal process is very lenient. Um, we don't ask for a lot of uh, justification for your observations. The only time we really ask for justification is if you're asking for a lot of time. If you're just looking at one or two stars or something like that. Just say, you know, I want to look at this star. And you might say, because it doesn't have very many observations in the database or something. And that's perfectly reasonable to, to say. If you want to make a nice justification, uh, we're always happy to read them. But uh, uh, don't feel like you have to, you know, research the star and spend months trying to learn everything there is to know about it before you go and ask for observations. Just submit a proposal. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Good to know. Okay, we have uh, two specific questions that are a follow-up to that. 
So first of all, um, we have a question here from George Schoberg who asked, is responding to alert notices for the support of the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, those kind of observing campaigns that go out, um, would that be a proper use of AAVSONet? Uh, yes, of course, uh, no problem at all. What often happens on those is that other people are also interested in observing the same object. And so they will, when an alert notice comes out, you'll sometimes see two or three proposals come in um, from observers who want to look at a specific object. And what we do in cases like that is we assign them to individual telescopes. So the first observer might get data from BSM New Hampshire. The next observer will get it from BSM South or something like that. And so there's no overlap and we can handle multiple observers in cases like that. Excellent, thank you. Okay, and then uh, also along that theme, we had a question from Jack Fitzmaier, who asked whether it would be acceptable to use a VSONet in order to pursue one of the Astronomical League's observing programs. I would think so. Um, I seem to recall that those observing programs sometimes have a large number of stars on them. Um, so you just have to be a little careful because if you ask for data on 100 stars, um, first of all, somebody has to put all those objects into the queue of the telescopes, so it involves some of the manpower. And in addition to that, you know, if you start talking a half an hour per star or something, well, then you're talking, you know, a fair number of hours on the telescope. So um, I would say go ahead and do it. Uh, if you uh, are looking for that kind of, um, um, you know, support, uh, getting the award from the uh, ALS observing programs uh, certificates. Well, that's fine. Um, submit it and see what happens. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next question here comes from Eric Crane, who asks, how are the calibrated images provided to the observer? And I'll go ahead and answer that one too, and then I'll, okay. I'll stay quiet for a while. <laughs> there, are, there are two ways. Um, we either have it, and it's listed on the proposal form. You can have your images sent directly to VFOD. And so every time that the telescope observes, images will show up there and you will get an email message that says, you know, that you've got data. And the other way is that it goes on the anonymous FTP site for the AVSO net. And so it gives you instructions as to how to retrieve the images themselves from there. So you can do it either way. Uh, we don't send them to individual observers or anything like that. It, it only goes to those two spots at this point. Good to know, thank you. Okay, uh, here's a question which might be good for uh, maybe Frank or Phil or Enrique to take. Um, so Roland would like to know, what is the typical uh, error that you see on measured magnitudes with AABS on it? Well, actually, normally, or there's a standard, we can say somehow, that it should be less than 0.2 of a magnitude. Uh, let, let, let's say like that. No, that's, that's acceptable, no? Uh, for example, in, in the observations I got uh, so far, which which are a lot actually from ASCAS, uh, we are showing an error overall of 0 0.07. So it's it's very low actually. Good to know, Phil Frank. Would either of you like to weigh in? Also, with LPVs, they're really red, <laughs> and uh, you know some of the best comp stars are really red, and they tend to vary the load themselves so it's a it's it's a it's a juggling act to try to get good comps so i'd say probably on a, on a good star 0 0.02 on a bad star 0 0.08 and i have problem child problem child stars the ones we showed weren't any of those they were good stars so uh, probably a, around 0 0.2 on the good ones maybe let, better. Let, me, let me chime in here too I think, I think it depends on your uh, signal noise ratio in the star. So if you have really good signal noise ratio in the star, uh, you can have very small, uh, you know, uncertainties, you know, point, 0 0.02 and less. Uh, so it also depends on 
what software you're using <laughs> and how you do your uh, how you do your uh, observing. If you're do if you're using uh, uh, an ensemble photometry in VFOT, I think the the uh, the uh, uncertainties are, are 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 a little bit higher than they need to be. Uh, but in any event, point if you're in point. Point two, point three is is common in my in my measurements. Okay. Zero, I mean, point, point zero point zero two or zero point zero three. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so next question. Speaking of ensemble photometry, this one comes from Alan Gilchrist, who asked if there have been any recent developments in VFOT when it comes to doing photometric transformations with ensembles of comparison stars. Well, I, I can answer that. Okay. Um, now, I, I tend to uh, use the. It's called the two color transform. Uh, analysis. It's part of the VFO, and I don't think that's changed again in, a, in quite in quite a while. But it works really well for me. That's my favorite way of, of transforming. I haven't tried using uh, T TA yet, but so I don't can't speak to TA. But the the uh, the, the two color uh, transform. Uh, a plier is great. Um, George Silvis has been working, George Silvis and Ken Menzies have both been working on the, the transformation part of VFOT and they do use, allow ensembles now and they will actually do what's called aggregation. So if you take three exposures of a particular filter uh, it will go ahead and combine those and give you mean and standard deviation in the whole works. So it's getting quite a uh, uh, nice way of, of handling transformation is through VFO. It, is that going to be in VFO, Arnie? Yes, it is. Oh, fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, so our next question here comes from Antonio, who asks, um, I saw that the Bright Star monitors are using E180 Takahashi's and ZWO ASI 183mm cameras. Those cameras are only 12 bit. Is this type of camera recommended for photometry? Um, yeah, you can. Uh, what we do on the E180s is we actually bend the cameras two by two. And so that gives you effectively 14 bits of resolution as opposed to 12. Um, and then you can also stack an additional, you know, four images before you go and, and uh, uh, report it. And now you're up to 16 bits. And so there are ways in which you can take a 12-bit camera and get even more resolution. But 12 bits is actually sufficient for doing decent photometry. So it works out fine. It would be nice to upgrade the systems to, you know, a true 16-bit CMOS camera, but we haven't gone to that uh, step yet. Thank you. Good to know. Okay. Um, our next question here comes from Celsa Canada, who was wondering about a particular star, Beta Lyra. Now that's a real bright star. And um, Celsa would like to know if AVSO net would be a good choice for studying the star. You can do it. I mean, it is a bright star. Uh, the the problem with bright stars is that the comparison star that you might want to use for a bright star often is degrees away from the uh, target star itself. So if you can find a bright star that has a comparison star that's within sort of the degree and a half field of view of the bright star monitors, then usually we have either the CMOS cameras, which can do millisecond exposures, and we also have neutral density filters, especially on BSM New Hampshire, so we can actually cut the light down to a point where you can observe stars that are, you know, extremely bright, so sort of first, second magnitude, if you really wanted to. But the, the real problem is finding a comparison star for those bright stars. Okay, that makes sense. 
Thank you. Now here we have a question that's um, specifically for Phil. So uh, Phil, um, James Harbin would like to know, what was the name of that star that stopped eclipsing in the 1980s that you mentioned during your presentation? QX Cass. Okay. QX Cass. And if you go to the uh, main AVSO homepage, there's a place where you can enter a question. And if you just put QX CAS in there, that'll point you toward uh, extended comment by uh, Arnie about that, about that particular star. Okay, good to know. Thank you. All right, uh, next question here. This one comes from Eric de Blackmere, who says, I would like to get involved with spectroscopy using AAVSO net. How do I get started? Um, as of right now, it's a little bit more difficult. We have one SA200 diffraction grading on BSM Barry. I'll be sending another SA200 to uh, BSM Texas very shortly, and we hope to get that on that uh, particular system. So for very bright objects, uh, there will be low resolution spectroscopy available. There is an eShell spectrograph that's on the New Zealand telescope, OC61. Um, but the telescope itself is currently undergoing refurbishment, and we're sort of waiting until the new uh, telescope control system gets installed and the new QHY600 camera gets installed on that telescope. And then we will, uh, the next step is to go ahead and resurrect the eShell. That gives you an art resolution of like 12,000 or something. Mm -hmm. But for only, again, for bright objects, because you're spreading the light out so much. So things that are sort of fifth, sixth, seventh magnitude, uh, you can easily do with that system. Anything fainter than that, it gets a lot harder. Um, there are a couple other telescopes that we hope to add to the network over the next year or so that do have lower resolution spectrographs that I think would be uh, very useful for, for learning spectroscopy and um, you know, doing some research projects, but uh, they're not along, far enough along for me to actually say that you know, they're gonna come online in June or something like that. So keep watching. All right, thank you. Okay. Um... Next question. Well, it looks like we've got two here that are related to time periods. So the first one is just asking, um, how long does it typically take for a proposal from a user to get approved and then for the first images to start coming in? It, it depends a little bit. We have some give and take in the allocation committee, and so it might take a few days to go through that. And then Ken Menzies is the one who puts the uh, target on the queue of the telescopes. So that might take a couple days. So it's not something that can be done overnight, but certainly within the period of three, four or five days or something like that, we can usually uh, go through the, the whole process and have the star on observing queues. And then you just have to wait for good weather before you actually start seeing data. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense, thank you. And um... The other question about time periods, uh, this one is from Eric Crane, who asks, what are reasonable periods of time to reserve uh, proprietary use of images? And is this a factor in awarding telescope time? It's not a factor in awarding telescope time. Um, the, the normals for professionals are six months to a year. If you get HST data, for, for example, then you get proprietary time on with your images before it sort of gets released. Um, so six months to a year is a kind of a typical number. And you notice I said that the Epic Photometry database, uh, at the end of the year, I uh, we turn the crank and um, add stars to, the, to that database. They are always a year out of date. So you have with AVSO net, you have at least a year in which you have proprietary access to the data, even if you don't specify a period. Okay, good to know. Thank you. All right, and uh, 
let's see, we had one other question that's related to time frames, although this one from a different tech. So this comes from Bob Napier, who asks, um, is there a time limit on single observations that might last as long as three or four hours, such as a time series watching an exoplanet transit? No, we have done entire nights on a single star if, if necessary. But the restriction is that you are using a telescope for your entirely for your own research. And that means it's not available for other people under those conditions. And so if you're going to ask for a large fraction of time like that, then we ask that you justify the use of that time. So doing a single exoplanet transit, you know, there's usually no problem in getting people, getting enough time for, for somebody to do that. But if you want to do test follow-up where you have dozens of objects and you want to do a time series on each one of those, well, now you're trying, now you're using, you have an exclusive use of the telescope for significant periods of time. And you really should justify why you should get the time and not some other AVSO member. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so let's see, we had one question here. Uh, oops, I just accidentally hit the dismiss button. Let me pull it back up. Um, okay, yes. Um, can I access images which have been provided to other users or are they exclusively, you know, that one user sees them and then that's it? Um, it kind of, it kind of depends on the, on the situation. I hate to say, uh, for the, the one year period, you know, then it, it's a deal in which what we usually do is we ask the observer whose images were original, were taken originally for, and, uh, make sure that it's okay with that observer that, uh, somebody else gains access to the data. What we don't want to have happen is duplicate observations being submitted to the uh, AID. And so if you're looking at the image for some other variable that happens to be in that particular field of view, then there's usually no problem because that data hasn't been submitted to the AVSO. But if you want to just reprocess the uh, observations of a particular target, then you know we don't generally um, recommend that because there's somebody else has already done that with that particular image. Um, but um, making uh, images available to observers for multiple uh, reasons certainly is something that we can do and have done in the past. Thank you. All right, and then we had two questions come in that I really like. So um, first one is asking, how would one go about collaborating or donating a new observatory to AAVSONET? Oh. Hmm. <laughs> Contact me and we'll take it from there. <laughs> Usually the, it's, it's, you know, get, Somebody donating a telescope is one thing, and somebody offering to uh, put their telescope on AVSONet uh, so that they're continuing to operate it, continuing to maintain it, that's something entirely different. And so each case is a, is a unique case, and we just have to look at it and see how well it fits sort of our plan for the future for the network. But if you have, you know, a little one meter telescope somewhere that you want to put on the network, <laughs> I don't think it's going to get turned down. <laughs> gotcha. All right, thanks. And then um, related to that, we had a question come in asking, uh, so other than submitting proposals and then using the resulting data, what are some other ways that someone who's interested can get involved with AAVS on it? We have a team of for people, I guess, that do most of the software related administrative stuff. Um, and adding somebody else who's a good programmer, uh, we we never turn that down because it's, you know, it's it's not a lot of work, but it's complex work. And so 
if somebody happens to be gone or something like that and, and uh, a problem arises, then it gets a little bit tricky. So having backups and having new people in that particular team, I think is wonderful. But in addition to that, we have people who operate the telescopes. We have people who host the telescopes. We have people that uh, examine the images uh, uh, from each telescope every night so that they can look for problems that might arise. The telescope drive is starting to trail. The images are out of focus, whatever. And so all there's a whole variety of uh, volunteer opportunities with the network. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, by all means, contact us and, and um, we'll see if we can fit you in someplace. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. We've got two questions here that are pretty highly related. So I'm actually going to read out both of them and you may give them the same answer more or less. Um, so uh, first, Timothy Weaver had asked about the four inch telescope, which was mentioned in the description for this event um, and said, could that be used for bright star observations? And if so, what is the field of view on that telescope? And then we also had someone who asked about um, whether you've considered adding a telephoto camera lens that would have a wide field of view to the network. So we've got people who are interested in wide field of view, so. Okay. The first telescope, the four inch is a Teleview NP102 or something like that, I believe it is, it's BSM Texas. Um, that one uh, actually uses a QHY 268 camera. So it has a very wide field of view. I think it's two by three degrees or something like that uh, with very good scene. And so it's really a nice setup. Um, and you can observe bright stars with it, but you can also almost go as faint as you can with the, the seven inch uh, astrographs too, because it's just in a, a pristine location. Uh, in Southwest Texas, right by McDonald Observatory, as a matter of fact. And as far as telephoto lenses, George Silvis is putting together a uh, bright star monitor, which does use a telephoto lens and uh, DSLR at this point. And so he's experimenting with that. And if he uh, is happy with the results, well, then that certainly can be added to the network. And we're looking, we're we're looking into those things. So we're going both directions. We're going with you know the bigger, wider fields as well as the bigger apertures uh, to try to accommodate a large number of research projects. Awesome. The flexibility is really impressive here. OK, um, let's see. So Eric Crane has a question. How do we handle co-authorship for AAVSO net operators? Um, can we interact directly with the operator vis-a-vis -vis publication? Most professional journals require author sign-off on some sort of uh, project participation. Sure. Um, you know, if you have data and it's being taken from one or two or three of the a, uh, BS, uh, AVSO net sites, then just contact us and we'll get you in contact with, with those uh, operators. And if you want to add them to the paper, that's, you know, I'm sure they'll be appreciative. Great, thanks. Okay, um, let me just take a look at these questions. We've got several in the queue here. Okay, so this one came from Jamie Jenkins, who would like to know how an AAVSO net observer should perform transformations on their AAVSO net data. Um, he, he says the observer can't create their own coefficients. So what do you do? Um, that might be something for Phil, but uh, if you look at VFO, you will see that there are telescope profiles. And each one of the telescopes in AVSO net actually has coefficients uh, already determined for it. And they're just sitting there. And as long as you use VFO, um, it applies them automatically for you. You don't have to do anything. It already knows what telescope the images were taken with. So it's very convenient to do it that way. Nice. Just, uh, I'll add on to that. If you're using ensemble photometry, uh, you, you, I think, still need to use the uh, two-color transform a tool in VFO. 
I don't think yet that the uh, TA um, tool uh, can do ensembles. But Fugner Ensembles, is, it's very, very nice uh, tool to use. And that, that's what I use most of the time. So if you, if you, if you have VFOG, you could just look up in the menu and you'll see, you have to, you have to select two images with different filters and uh, then select the two, two color transforms. The two color, it's just, it says two colors and something else. And that applies transfer. It does the photometry, you use that to, to do the measurement and to apply the transforms. Okay, thank you. Really good to know. All right, um, next question. Okay, this, this has been touched on before, but I feel like it, it deserves to uh, be clarified again. Um, so we had someone saying that they're in the Canary Islands and they have two telescopes, uh, 11 inch uh, and an eight inch Celestron. And they'd like to know who to contact if they're interested in donating these scopes to AABSO Net. Um, are you going to run them from the Canary Islands? Then we're very interested. Uh, just contact me and I'll pass it on to the right person or just go to the AVSO Net at avso.org. Uh, email address and send something there and it'll get routed to most of the management team. Great, thank you. I'm just typing that uh, email address here into the chat so that anyone who wants can go ahead and copy paste and save that. So that's that's your general contact right there. Yep. All righty. Uh, let's see. So next up, we have a question about um, will you cancel already approved telescope time if there's some sort of special event which occurs, like a supernova that needs to take priority? What happens is that all the observations go into a queue and they're given a priority. So generally people who are proposing observations quite often are just doing what we call snapshot observations where they want to get one set of say BVRI each night. Um, and the queue manager is really effective in taking care of that kind of situation. So it can handle, you know, hundreds of uh, individual targets and it just optimizes the way it moves from one telescope, from one field to another and takes exposures through the night. But if you have something that's coming up that's, you know, time critical, uh, a supernova goes off in our galaxy or something like that, then what we do is we just give it a very high priority. And so it sort of takes over, um, it, it does those observations first. Um, and so there is a way in which we can sort of um, prioritize who gets time on the telescope, but it takes a very special event before we go and do that. And so in general, it's just a big queue of, of a few hundred objects and in a typical bright star monitor night, it'll go through 70 to 100 objects and acquire data for those and, and uh, ship them off to the various observers. And we've got nine telescopes in the network. So we can actually handle large numbers of uh, individual proposals. So, you know, if you have a time critical observation, then what you should do is when you put in your proposal, you say that it is time critical and we want those observations taken immediately. And that actually bumps the, the uh, telescope allocation committee uh, to look at your proposal first and try to force it through the, the process as quickly as possible so that data can start being acquired. Great, that sounds like a good system. Okay, um, we have time for just a couple more questions before we need to wrap up. So um, next question here comes from Wayne Green, who asked if you've ever considered attaching a, a wide field O3 filter, uh, piggyback on a scope and just taking potluck on whatever it's pointing at um, in order to search for planetary nebulae. He says that the, uh, sometimes they are discovered that way. No, <laughs> we haven't thought of that. Uh, now you will. <laughs> 
There is a uh, survey that's underway called the MDWH Alpha Survey, which is doing a survey of the entire sky. And that's actually, if you search on MDW, Mike, David, William, uh, H Alpha Survey, you will find the appropriate website and see what kind of data they're taking. And you can do that, you know, you can find planetary nebulae with H Alpha as well as you can with O3. And so it's just another way of uh, of uh, looking with narrowband filters at the typical nebular emission lines. So it would be nice to do O3, but we we don't really have a setup to do that at this point. I think there's an O3 filter in one of the systems as well as H alpha in, in at least one of the systems. So we can do narrowband filters. We just don't do it as a matter of course. Okay. Well, that's good to know that that one system has one. Okay, um, so next question here. Um, can or is AAVSONet capable of measuring variable stars that are in other nearby galaxies like M31 or the Large Magellanic Cloud? You can do M31 for the brighter stars. For instance, there's a uh, Cepheid variable in M31 called V1, which was one of the was the first variable star discovered, I think, in M31. And uh, it takes sort of a 14 inch telescope, 12 to 14 inch telescope to be able to measure it because it's like 19th or 20th magnitude. And so you can do it with the larger telescopes of the of the uh, network, the, the three 24 inch telescopes. Uh, and those telescopes, because they're run as uh, partnerships or with universities, are actually in very good sites with good seeing. And so uh, that's the other aspect that you need in order to be able to look at things in the Large Mag Magellanic Cloud or M31 or whatever, is you need to have that resolution. And those telescopes can actually do that. And so, yeah, you can, there are lots of stars in the nearby galaxies that you can, you can observe, as well as globular clusters and things like that. Um, it's pretty amazing what you can do with amateur telescopes today. Here, here. <laughs> and I'll add to that, that, um... I'm currently studying a star in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's a particularly luminous one, and uh, AVSONet data has been uh, absolutely excellent for this star compared to the other data sets that I have available. So that in that Epoch Photometry database, wasn't expecting to find much, but there was a really great light curve in there. So, and that one's in the LMC. Okay, um, so I think we've got time for just one more question. Uh, this one comes from Ray Tomlin, who asked, what is the operations plan for AABSONet for, you know, let's say the next 30 years, the long term? Is it dependent on uh, current staff is what Ray's getting at here? Uh, we would like to have some younger faces uh, involved in AABSONet. It seems like everybody that is doing most of the programming today are gray haired older people. And it would be nice to get some younger people in the crowd to uh, volunteer their time and be there to take over when we finally retire. It's amazing how long it takes to retire, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's it's um, I think a viable uh, network, and I think it's going to stick around for a long time. But uh, I think there's plenty of opportunity for for growth and change. And it would be nice to have different faces that are involved in, in that process. Absolutely. All right, thank you. I think that was the last question that we had time for. We do have a couple of questions uh, still left in the queue that are uh, a little bit more off topic. You know, they might be just about photometry in general and not AVSONet. Um, if any of you who are here today would like to take a look at that and supply an answer, please feel free. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up our closing slide here. Um, there we go. All right. So uh, first of all, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to Dr. Hendon, Enrique, Phil, and Frank for sharing their time and knowledge with us today. This has been a really great session. Thanks to you guys. Um, we really appreciate it. I would also like to thank again our series sponsor, Voice Astro. The Voice Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, 
observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please feel free to check out their webpage to learn more about their work.